Mesa, por lo menos. So the plane cannot take off until everyone is seated. Uh, and we'll close the doors. Until the ash goes <laughs> Until the ash is clear. Okay, I think we'll start. Good morning. <clears throat> My name is Jerry Davis, and I'm Dean of the USC Davis School of Gerontology and Executive Director of the Andrus Gerontology Center. Uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome you all here this morning for a one-day interdisciplinary conference on aging research and application at USC. We could have had a two- or three-day conference, and I anticipate we'll have more conferences like this. But today we're just going to try to provide an overview, a sampling of some of the interesting research being done at USC, both on this campus and at the Health Sciences campus. Complex scientific and applied problems call for complex study and implementation. The ways that people and other organisms change over time, and especially as they age into old age, represent great intellectual and social challenges. And these require interdisciplinary collaboration of the kind that we'll be discussing today. Since their founding in 1964 and 1975, respectively, the Andrews Gerontology Center and the USC Davis School have been the focus and for, of and catalyst for numerous interdisciplinary investigations into the processes of aging. Often in collaboration with colleagues on the University Park and the Health Sciences campus and even cross town at UCLA and elsewhere, our faculty, staff, and students have explored the interactions among biological, sociological, and psychological factors in how people age, and how they develop over time, and how they, uh, how they became, become older. And this is evolving into what some have begun to call gerontological science. And there are, there are important societal applications that derive from this science, and we'll be um, sampling some of the, those today as well. With regard to application, I want to say just briefly that while the focus of our school and this center um, is primarily on research and education, we have for many years provided evidence-based services to tens of thousands of older people and their families in the Los Angeles area. Most of them are members, because of the demographics, most are members of minority and lower income groups. 
and via the web we have provided information and service to people in cyberspace, as it were. These services have been provided through the work of such units in, our, uh, in this building as the Los Angeles Caregiver Resource Center, the Teenstad Old Redell Counseling Center, which is actually down the street a little bit, the Fall Prevention Center of Excellence, and in collaboration with the Keck School of Medicine, the Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. These are some of the uh, units that are affiliated with us or um, primarily run by us that provide uh, evidence-based services. In fact, one of the defining features of our own university is USC's commitment to translational research. And I, I believe we're going to be seeing many interesting examples uh, of that today. <clears throat> Before going any further, I want to acknowledge the central contributions of my assistant dean, Maria Hankey. Maria, would you please wave? Is she in the room? I can't say too much about, I can't say enough about Maria. Um, she's um, organized this conference. I also want to thank a number of other people, Eileen Crimmins and Tuck Finch, who will be speaking to you today for their invaluable in input into the planning of the conference. I want to thank Vice Provost Su Ping Ku for her continued support of our efforts and this conference, and I want especially to thank Vice Provost of Research Randy Hall, whom I'll be introducing to you in a moment. If things go well, it'll be due to their creative efforts. And if things don't go well, you blame the dean. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I'm quite confident things will go very well because we have a sterling group of researchers and, um, and applied people both in our program and in our audience. The program is composed of several panels on various aging topics. We've asked each panelist to speak for no more than 15 minutes so as to leave ample time for Q&A, both among the panelists and in particular with members of the audience. Keeping um, academics to a 15-minute presentation may be one of the most daunting challenges we face today. So um, we're, we're going to try, and we have um, uh, Whitney Fontas, who is in the rear, is going to be holding up uh, signs. She's just holding up one for me, too. <coughs> I asked her to do it, but I started late. <laughs> and uh, we hope that you will heed these signs so we can move along expeditiously. We hope that uh, we'll have a focus on interactivity. This kind of forum is not really efficient or terribly effective to provide things in depth. I mean, for that one has things that appear in what we call words that are sometimes on a page, sometimes on a computer screen. We hope that we'll um, uh, whet your appetite. Also, with this is being webcast, uh, even as we speak, and also being videotaped. And this is part of the uh, uh, distance learning uh, programs and efforts that this school has been engaged in uh, for the past 15 or so years. Uh, and this was an effort that was begun by my friend and colleague and, and former dean, um, Ed Schneider. Uh, I want to just mention a few people who are here. Um, we have a, few pe a couple of people from our Board of Counselors, other Lauren Shook and Karen Luce are, are here, and we welcome you and thank you for your attendance. I want especially to um, welcome and acknowledge the presence of uh, Jim Beeren and his wife Betty. Jim is the, the dean, the, always the dean of the school. And it's, a, it's an honor, Jim and, and uh, Betty, to have you here today. It's now my pleasure to introduce the Vice Provost for Research Advancement at USC, Randy Hall. Randy has been kind enough to co-sponsor and underwrite most of the expenses for this conference. And along with other members, uh, as well as other members of the Provost's office, he has been very, very supportive of our efforts. And it's a, a delight to have you here, Randy. Good morning. My daughter is about to turn 18 and will soon be heading off to college. Being that age, 17, she has spent her entire life thinking that getting older is a good thing. <laughs> I, I suspect that most of the people in this audience today have passed that age where you stop thinking that getting older is the thing to do and start wondering what the future holds uh, because of the aging process. If you are like me, you start thinking at some point about 
what will happen when I become older and what diseases might afflict me because of the age I reach. You might think about the capabilities you might lose one day. Will I lose my hearing? Will I lose my sight? Will I need that hip replacement or knee replacement? Will I lose my mobility? And when will that end of life come? These are the issues that we start thinking of when we get beyond age 17. Aging processes are important in this nation because we are fortunate, however. Uh, we have improved the conditions in this country that have caused an early end of life. Uh, we do not worry, as in other countries, about unsafe drinking water. We don't worry so much about famine. Uh, death in childbirth, while it does occur, doesn't occur at the same rates it once did or as it occurs in other countries. Childhood disease, much of that is prevented today. Uh, death due to poor medical care is less common. And to a degree, um, violence as a cause of death has been lessened in this country. But of course, we like it to be even lower. This is not true everywhere in the world. I've already survived more years than the average life expectancy in 20 nations most of those nations in, the, in Africa. And this wasn't always true in America as well. I survived more years now than, the, than my, uh, two of my grandparents, both of whom likely would have become senior citizens if they had the type of preventive care that we have today and have the same medical capabilities that we have today. Instead, they died at a younger age. In the last 200 years, one year of extra lifespan has been added for about every four years of historical time. And much of this is due to eliminating the conditions that cause those early ends of life. Today, um, we, are, we are experiencing a great increase in the number of people who are living to older age, living beyond the age of 65 that we view as the traditional age of retirement. When our social security system was created in 1940, the average life expectancy was just 63 years. The retirement age was 65. So the average person never had the opportunity to benefit from social security at the time it was created. It was designed to support those fortunate few who survived into older age. Today we have close to 39 million people 65 years and older. And by 2030, we expect to have more than 72 million people older than that age of 65. And while it's great that people are surviving more years, it's also not an easy thing getting older. It's not easy for the individuals always, and it's not always easy for society. As we extend our lives, can we afford the luxury of early retirement? And what will be the burden on the youth of society for all the retirees that we have? How will we support those who live longer but lose the ability to work? What will happen to our health care system it become, as it becomes increasingly government supported because retirees are predominantly supported by a government health care uh, finance system? What will be the roles of the generations as the balance changes across different ages of population? And how do we maintain a high quality of life as we live longer? These are some of the social issues surrounding aging as we, as we go forward. Today's conference is a reflection of the kind of interdisciplinary approach that is needed to address the challenges we face by an increasingly older and aging society. Today we will hear from a consortium of biologists, demographers, sociologists, psychologists, economists, as well as scholars representing fields as diverse as medicine and architecture. These scientists strive to solve some of society's most difficult challenges. For example, every 70 seconds, someone in America is diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. USC has been a leader in Alzheimer's research for the past 25 years. One of the first federally funded Alzheimer's disease research centers in the country was started here in this building under the leadership of Tuck Finch and is now located on the health science campus of USC, but it involves the entire university. In addition to searching for a cure for Alzheimer's disease, researchers must examine how to care for the 5.3 million people in this country who currently have the disease and how to pay the $172 billion cost each year related to the treatment and care. USC is also home to the Los Angeles Caregivers Resource Center, which supports the efforts of some of the 10.9 million unpaid caregivers who try and provide care to friends and family members under the leadership of Dr. Bob Knight. Falls are leading 
are the leading cause of injury-related deaths in the United States. Research tells us with the right interventions, the rate of falls can be significantly reduced. USC is the home of the Fall Prevention Center of Excellence, which is leading the way to policy, programs, and practices that will keep seniors living independently under the leadership of Dr. John Pinos, who will be speaking later today. Today we are delighted to have distinguished faculty from six of USC schools and the USC College represented here. Many of these faculty work collaboratively on research projects such as USC's first Rehab Engineering Research Center under the leadership of Carolee Winstein uh, from um, preventive medicine, uh, not from preventive medicine, um, dentistry. dentistry, sorry. Uh, this center brings together scientists from the School of Dentistry's Division of Biokinesiology and Physical Therapy and the Division of Occupational Science and Occupational Therapy, the Davis School of Gerontology, the Viterbi School of Engineering, the Rossier School of Education, the Keck School of Medicine, Stevens Institute for Innovation, the Information Sciences Institute, and the Institute for Creative Technologies, truly interdisciplinary center. In addition to working with our colleagues across campus, USC is forging relationships with other institutions. For example, the USC UCLA Center on Biodemography and Population Health, funded by the National Institute on Aging, under the leadership of Eileen Crimmins and her colleagues from gerontology, as well as colleagues from psychology, engineering, preventive medicine, and economics. In addition to a long list of distinguished faculty from UCLA and other institutions from around the world. Uh, in the last year, we have also expanded our capabilities to conduct aging research in significant ways through recruitment. The Schaefer Center for Health Policy and Outcomes was established this year under the leadership of Dana Goldman. He's part of a group that was uh, recruited from Rand Corporation in the last year. Within the center is the NIH-funded Roy Ball Center for Health Policy Simulation, which uses database tools and predictive models to forecast disease, health expenditures, and demographic trends among elderly populations. And last, the Roy Ball Institute on Aging is now under the leadership of William Vega, who recently joined the university. And he, is, he, through the center, is developing and researching interventions that improve the health of older persons, particularly from low-income and multi-ethnic backgrounds. And I'll add that the leaders of both of those centers are members of the Institute of Medicine. I'd like to conclude by thanking Jerry Davison in particular for proposing this conference. I get a lot of requests for funding for various things in my office. This was one of the easiest ones for me to say yes, which I think I did almost instantly. Uh, the Davis School of Gerontology has a long history of leading interdisciplinary research on all aspects of aging, and it is the right place to bring together the best minds on the critical national issue of aging research. And I welcome you all today, and I look forward to an exciting day of speakers. Thanks. Does this project? Mm -hmm. Good. Well, I'm delighted to uh, begin this symposium uh, with a presentation uh, with my colleague Kelvin Davis uh, on the basic aspects of biogerontology. And I would like to just put this in the context uh, in a simple cartoon that uh, points out uh, several things. One is, as we all know, we're on one of these curves of increased mortality risk, and before this is a uh, curve which represents increased uh, presence of disease and frailty, and the shape of these curves uh, is very much influenced by the environment that we're in. They can shift uh, backwards and forwards, and in some way yet to be discovered, uh, our underlying human genetics, and driving this is a mythical times arrow of aging processes which still has yet to be defined uh, in any precise way. So our objectives uh, 
in the basic <coughs> sciences of aging are to understand what the fundamental processes of aging are that influence the expression of disease that lead to increased mortality risk and to present them to our uh, colleagues and our community in such a way that uh, applications can be made uh, that will reduce uh, the, the risk of being higher on this curve every year of our life. Now, I'd like to put this in a broader perspective and ask you to focus on the far right side, which refers to a comment that uh, Vice Provost Hall just made, that in the last 200 years, one year of lifespan has been added life expectancy has been added for every four years of historical time. Uh, there were almost no centenarians 18, in 1800, 200 years ago. Now centenarians are the fastest growing demographic group on the face of the earth. So not only has early mortality been uh, reduced, but life expectancy has been added at every age. And in some fundamental way, our improving environment during the l industrialization of the world in the last 200 years has radically slowed human aging processes. So the current record holder for longevity is Jean Calment, who made it to 122. I think the closest competitor at this point is somebody 118, something like that. Uh, but we have no idea of what enables a fortunate few to pass the 90th and the 100th and the 110th uh, years and maintain some level of function. And she was cognitively intact uh, up to the very end of her life and known for making witty and sometimes scathing remarks about the people around her. <laughs> but. And all of this has happened, uh, this huge expansion of longevity, in only 10 generations. So I, as a basic biologist, I just want to reflect back on our earlier evolutionary history that coming from a shared ancestor with the great apes six million years ago, we doubled our lifespans by reference to them up to 1800, and then we've doubled it again. And as a biologist, I see no uh, fundamental cellular or molecular barrier for continued increase of health span and longevity, but we have a major problem ahead, as will be described later this, in this symposium, with our deteriorating environment. A brief history of biogerontology at USC. Uh, Jim Biron, who is sitting there, Jim, could you raise your hand, has uh, recruited me and uh, several others who are in this room. Jim is, was known as a psychologist, but he actually published uh, a major paper in a basic biological aspect of aging, looking at n neurons in a rat and showing that one of the spinal neurons, in fact, didn't lose any cells during aging and in fact maintained its conduction velocity. So this was a paper you published in 1956, I think, something like that, that influenced me as a graduate student, and I thought it was a wonderful opportunity to just uh, give a wave to an ancient connection in my own career that uh, led me to think about the neurobiology of aging as a subject that could be developed. The center here, its labs opened in 1972, and I was the first uh, wet lab here. There was a, a group of us that were looking at the neurobiology, physiological psychology of aging, uh, Larry Thompson, Ernie Green in psychology. By 1980s, the neuroscience programs on both campuses were recruiting faculty and focusing on memory and neurological disease. Dick Thompson, Michelle Boder, Baudry, Les Weiner, Joe Vandermeulen, Helena Chu, uh, Lon Schneider, all part of this. The biochemistry of aging was being uh, established uh, in another entity in the School of Pharmacy with Kelvin Davies, Enrique Cardenas, Henry Foreman, uh, Alex Savanian. So uh, in a cryptic way, USC was uh, uh, establishing several uh, 
fronts in the basic biology of aging that uh, have been major platforms for the whole field. We got a training grant in the neurobiology and endocrinology of aging in 1983. 1984, as uh, Randy Hall mentioned, we developed the Alzheimer's Disease Research Center, which had a huge role in supporting neurosciences on both campuses. Um, through a leadership award, I got, we trained 10 faculty. Uh, I might mention that recently, three of us have gotten Ellison Foundation Senior Science Awards, Norm Arnheim, uh, myself, and John Tower. And all together, I, uh, it's a, a, at least 40 careers have been launched by researchers trained in biogerontology who've gone on uh, in this building. So that's a brief history. So now I'd like to talk about some hot topics uh, which will be uh, elaborated to varying degrees. Uh, Kelvin Davies will talk about oxidative stress. Uh, this is part of the whole larger subject of inflammation and aging. All of the major diseases of aging have a core of processes which involves inflammation. The same aspect of your responses to infection are ongoing in blood vessels and in Alzheimer's disease and in cancer. And there's a, a huge area of work that is leading to drugs uh, on, on that that Kelvin, Walter Longo, John Tower, and I have been part of. Uh, mitochondrial bioenergetics and aging, I, I imagine, I anticipate Kelvin will be talking about that involving some of the same figures. Major area that USC has contributed to in aging is damage to our cell DNA. Norm Arnheim particularly developing technology I'll show in a moment. Uh, but Myron Goodman, Longo Tower, myself have also had to do with this. The genetics of aging, uh, inherited influences on longevity is a major subject here. Diet and aging, applications to cancer, chemotherapy, and neurodegenerative disease. Walter, myself, Christian Pike. Exercise, aging, and neurodegeneration. John Walsh and Kelvin Davies uh, have uh, major contributions there. A big area at, U at USC is hormones and aging. Uh, sex steroids, myself, uh, Robbie Brenton, Christian Pike uh, on the sex steroids and Walter Longo on growth hormones. Uh, an area that we're able to contribute to uh, uh, in our campus uh, molecular biology strengths is the bioinformatics of aging. Uh, you should know that uh, our campus molecular biology department has a, a group of 10 uh, theoretical biologists, mathematicians, who are doing cutting edge uh, work on genomics. Uh, they're theoreticians and they're wonderful people to collaborate with to understand what uh, gene changes mean in a broader context. And then lastly, but not least, is uh, our pioneering work in the biodemography of aging, uh, which Eileen Crimmins will also talk about. So we, we cover a number of, we have established here at USC uh, a number of uh, seminal research areas, uh, faculty across schools. Uh, sometimes the initiative came from uh, within these walls. Sometimes it came independently. But USC has a, a, a marvelous culture of collaboration that is, I think, uh, gives us uh, a great ability to synergize across disciplines that has, at least in my own career, uh, made me want to stay here uh, since I arrived in 1972. Let's see what has gone wrong here. Um, just mention a couple of new collaborations and programs that will come up in different circumstances. Uh, I've founded a group to look at air pollution effects on brain development and aging. J.C. Chen will join me on a program uh, later this morning. We call this the Air Paul Brain Group. There's another group of people uh, interfacing between gerontology, neurobiology, and engineering. Uh, one of their project is assistive robotics, Maya Matarich, uh, and Skip Rizzo will talk about that uh, in, at noon. 
Then Eileen Crimmins and I have a new project on looking at uh, people who are still living in traditional ways in jungles in uh, Africa and, uh, and, and South America, aging in pre-industrial societies to understand how human lifespan has evolved. And this is in collaboration with anthropologists uh, in other universities. So these are just a, a glimpse of some of the very diverse activities that we are able to do as a uh, scholarly community because of our high cult level culture of collaboration. So here's a few examples, uh, and I'll be brief on this and hope to uh, leave uh, ample time for discussion. Norm Arnheim uh, is uh, in molecular biology, and he is the the uh, inventor of a technique called polymerase chain reaction, which allows him to, uh, uh, and, and the field, to detect uh, rare, very rare mutations. And he's been examining how paternal age increases birth defects. This is a, uh, we are uh, mainly think of mater maternal age, but it, uh, in terms of Down syndrome, for example, but it turns out there's powerful effects of paternal age, and this is of importance in our demographic shifts because in, in general, each successive generation since World War II has had a later age of paternity, uh, particularly in, uh, ed among educated higher SES people. So the in incidence of this particular uh, mutation, Apert syndrome, which affects bone development, increases like this in the human populations, and norm Arnheim was able to document this in single sperm analysis, single cells, uh, that this is also uh, a, a counterpart in, in the actual mutation carried by sperm. Another piece of biotechnology comes from John Tower in molecular biology who studies fruit flies. And he's able to make genes glow uh, so that you can actually see in a living fly uh, which genes are active. And th th his uh, project goes beyond just looking at a fly that's glowing. These can actually, he can follow these in their 24-hour uh, activity pattern in a cage of flies so that we're able to follow gene activity across a fly lifespan in real time in a living fly without having to kill it. This gene is of particular interest because it lights up in aging flies, and it's a gene for the fly immune system. And this connects with what I mentioned before of the role of inflammation in aging. It turns out that immune system activation is a very general feature of aging in uh, animals, uh, invertebrates, as well as uh, vertebrates. I'm going to very briefly mention some of my work. I'm, this is not a, a formal lecture, but we've been interested uh, for some time in normal aging in the human brain that isn't associated with Alzheimer's disease or anything that could be defined as a clinical change. And it turns out, uh, work we did 30 years ago has been confirmed and developed, that uh, starting at the age of 30, we lose synapses at about the rate of a half percent to one percent per year without any loss of the nerve cells themselves. And this is a very general process that happens in humans, it happens in rodents, uh, and in some way, uh, intuitively, it links to the later age of onset of Alzheimer's disease. So at the same time as neurons are atrophying at a very slow rate, another cell type the astrocyte in the brain is getting bigger. And we've defined this at a molecular level and have asked the question then, is there a relationship between the enlargement or hypertrophy of astrocytes and the shrinkage of neurons? And uh, we've devised an experiment to test that in which we take uh, two culture dishes on one, we grow astrocytes from an old brain, the glial cells, and another from a young brain. And when they reach a, a layer, then we sprinkle 
uh, embryonic neurons on top of them and see how the age of the astrocyte influences the outgrowth of the embryonic neurons on top of them. And here you can see how these are young astrocytes and, and embryonic neurons in one day, two day, five days in culture, the neurons are growing very well. But when they're grown on top of old astrocytes, they don't grow very well at all. So that, that's a robust uh, observation that we now have a lot of insight into. We can manipulate and reverse this age change by uh, uh, regulating estrogen receptors. What have estrogen receptors got to do in the brain? Well, it turns out that they're fundamental in both male and female brains for many functions. And uh, they may have, uh, and the brain makes its own estrogen independent of the ovary or the testes. So there is a deep piece of, of, uh, uh, of biology in the brain that involves endocrinology, estrogen receptors that may, in a cascade of things, take us down to understand why synapses atrophy. Last topic uh, in three minutes and then open for discussion. Walter Longo, uh, when he was in the building uh, as a postdoc in my lab, he's unable to attend today, had a side project which I was happy to have him do, looking at aging in yeast cells. And this was a curiosity-driven project. You couldn't possibly think what aging in yeast cells would tell anything about a human organism. But he was interested in genes that uh, resisted stress. And it turned out that some of the genes that he found in yeast cells that were stress resistant, that increased the yeast cell lifespan, also showed up in other genetic studies of worms, uh, flies, and mice that defined a metabolic signaling pathway. So he noticed further that uh, these same genes responded in uh, cell, human cells uh, grown in culture which were put in short-term starvation and he compared them with tumor cells and it turns out that tumor cells respond differently to short-term starvation than normal cells. And he then took a wonderful leap uh, of intuition and he suggested that maybe because of this different response to nutritional stress to st short-term starvation, that would be a different strategy for chemotherapy and that cancer cells would be more vulnerable to chemotherapeutics during short-term starvation. So this is actually, uh, a study is underway and it is, uh, this is the documentation of this first in mice. Here are three different circumstances in which the mice are dying of cancer. That's the, the, blue, the blue bar is the, the death from cancer. And the red bar are the mice that were uh, starved and given the chemotherapeutics. So we have a mouse model that, that works. And this, it was enough to then take this into the clinic and he, uh, this is Walter's set, slide set for me, he has now 15 patients who have been signed up who are in a uh, clinical trial with short-term starvation associated with the administration of their uh, chemotherapeutic drugs. Here's a doctor in, uh, with uh, terminal prostate cancer who is uh, now uh, surviving beyond when he was expected to and reporting none of the toxicity associated with chemotherapy. So here's a self-report of severity of symptoms in people who received chemo with or without fasting, and it looks as though this is gonna increase remarkably the tolerance to uh, chemotherapeutics and maybe a new strategy. So I present this as a lovely example of how a discovery that was initiated by curiosity-driven research about in an organism that has nothing to do with human aging, pointed out a gene target that now is in clinical study. So let me close there and open for questions or comments.
Kelvin, you have another two minutes. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, in the patient's cell, on starvation, were the chemotherapeutic doses the same as if they would have? I can't answer that. Uh, this, I, 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 it would be a mistake for me to say anything about it. I have only those slides that I presented. How come were you talking about some of nor the norms work that you showed? You asked me how comfortable? How, so you showed a graph of Norm Arnheim. I had a question about it. Yes, go ahead. Um, I, I was quite interested. There was a very significant drop in mutations in adults at about 40, 44 ish. Yeah, there's a blip in the I, curve I was there. I I, any I, idea of why. I I don't know whether that was just a sampling issue or, or whether it was real. Can't answer, but the okay. documentation of the mutation frequency in sperm is unquestionable. I mean, this raises a whole set of questions as we prolong our educational duration and start our professional careers later, begin our families later. Women are no longer thinking it crazy to have their first kid at 40. There's actual work going back about 20 years out of Livermore. Uh, looking at male sperm and showing the incidence of uh, double Y sperm increasing just as yes. the graph you showed. And in fact, you yourself had a, a evidence of that nature 30 years ago at the NIH. This is Ed Schneider. Yes, Lauren. Is there action we can Is there any relationship between the growth of uh, obesity and the increase in cancer incidence is a, can you project from this research into the practical circumstances? Uh, who here would like to answer that? Ed? Yeah. Um, I could answer, but it's better that he's a, he's a doc. <laughs> One of the uh, occupational hazards of going to medical school. Uh, <laughs> there are a number of cancers that are associated with being overweight. So we would project that based on that and the epidemic of obesity that we're now seeing in children in America, that there will be an increase in cancers that are related to being overweight. Just time for one more question. Is there any uh, practical applications uh, relative to the knowledge of the estrogen receptors influence on the synapse atrophy in men and women? Uh, yes, direct because of the... Uh, questions of hormone therapy as a potential protection in Alzheimer's disease. And the, the pharmaceutical companies have hundreds of estrogen-like drugs that are being studied in various uh, animal models and also candidates for HT, which is a very controversial area, and I don't expect the controversy to lift for at least 10 years, but as a biologist, I think the arguments and the evidence is very strong that they benefit under defined circumstances. We don't know which those are yet. Okay, thank you. Well, good morning, everybody. I'd like to thank uh, Tuck for, as always, giving such a great presentation and a great introduction to all the, to just some of the things, actually, that are going on here in gerontology uh, at, in our school and across the university, uh, and for being such a great inspiration to lots of us in, in biogerontology. I'm going to follow up on, uh, Tuck was talking about some of Walter Longo's work on stress, <coughs> excuse me, and some of Walt, Walt is a younger guy, not like some, not like some of us. So some of Walter's work sort of grew out of the work that Tuck was talking about earlier that was done at USC. And I'm going to go back a little bit and, and go back to this, this idea of free radicals and oxidative stress and talk about the free radical theory of aging and how we think it might uh, now actually be involved in our diminishing ability to mount stress responses or responses to stress that enable us to cope with stress. And in particular, I'm talking about oxidative stress at a cellular or in a subcellular level. Let's see. There we go. So 
Free radicals and, and oxidative stress appear to play important roles in both aging and senescence, and there are thousands of studies out there that, that, that indicate this. Um, it got to the point where actually one of the uh, leaders in the field of, of, of aging got up at a meeting and said, well, all the other theories have been thrown out, so free radicals must be the reason we age. I'm not quite going to go that far, but I think a lot of people now uh, are comfortable with the idea that, that, that free radicals and oxidative stress in general play some role in the aging process and are some part of the underpinning of, of what happens in aging. So how do we get free radicals? How do they affect us? Where do they come from? Well, they come sort of from a lot of different places. Uh, Tuck mentioned earlier mitochondria and the work of people like Enrique Cadenas and, and, uh, and Alex Sivanian, who's no longer with us, uh, uh, Henry Foreman, uh, Raj Sohal is over at, at Health Sciences Campus, also myself, John Tower, uh, and others who've worked on mitochondria and mitochondrial generation of free radicals as part of normal metabolism as part of normal uh, uh, cellular energy production. But we also get free radicals produced by inf inflammatory responses. In fact, we use free radicals to kill invading organisms. Um, we also get it from ultraviolet light. It's part of the reason we're so concerned about, about ozone layers in the, in the, at the North Pole. Uh, from ionizing radiation, any form of radiation is going is to produce free radicals, produce oxidative stress. Uh, anybody uh, who's still smoking, you're doing it to yourself, so you're, you're, you're adding to the level. And all sorts of air pollution, as Tuck mentioned, there's a new group now starting to look at air pollution and, 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 and aging. So all of these things can cause oxidative stress and can cause damage to cellular constituents, including proteins, lipids, DNA, and all the other parts of us that make us what we are. So this is sort of the damage side of things. Well, we're, the, the whole idea of free radicals and aging came about because of work actually that started with Rebecca Gershman and then picked up by Denham Harmon. Um, the idea that this damaging reactions over a period of a whole lifetime can lead to a failure, uh, an org organic failure, um, and so that we're no longer able to, to cope with life. Um, the original free radical theory of aging proposed that this sort of was a gradual accumulation and occurred over the whole lifespan. At a, fairly predictable, pretty constant rate. And then by the end of, of, of 60, 70, 80 years, whatever it was, you accumulated enough damage that you no longer work properly. That basically was the original idea. Um, we started looking at this back in, uh, let's see, this was 81, I think. Um, sorry, not 81, uh, 91. Um, looking at revisiting this whole theory and saying, wait a minute, maybe it's not a gradual accumulation at the same rate throughout life. Maybe this is a process that changes in different parts of your lifespan, and maybe that's, that's why some of the data that people were looking at wasn't coming out the way they thought it might. So we started looking at, at, at various aspects. Now, you saw a slide that Tuck showed a little while ago uh, from Norman Arnheim that showed, in fact, that, uh, and other also s s um, Tuck slides on, on aging and age, uh, uh, age expectancies, that show these sort of exponential curves. They don't show a gradual straight line curve, they show exponential curves. And this is a study looking at protein oxidation, and I'm going to focus on proteins rather than lipids or rather than DNA. We could pick any, any number of cellular constituents, but to make my case today, I'm going to use proteins and the damage to proteins that we accumulate and the degradation or removal of those damaged proteins is my model. And this is data from a number of different labs, uh, especially Earl Stabman's and our lab and, 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 and some others, that looked at different human tissues and also mouse tissues and rat at the rate of acu or the accumulation of oxidative damage. And what you see basically is that you don't accumulate damage in the first two-thirds of life. You start accumulating damage in, in the last third of life. But the damage is, is occurring throughout life. So the rate of damage is the same. What's different is the accumulation. Early in life, the first two-thirds of life, you don't accumulate the damage. In the last third, the damage is being accumulated. So th something is different about our ability to remove that damage, and that's where we sort of started to go with this. So if, if we look at what we have to cope with oxidative stress, and it's all around us all the time, we're constantly exposed to free radicals and oxidative stress, you take a normal cell and expose it to these free radicals or oxidants, you're trying to take that normal cell to an oxidatively damaged cell, which might eventually die from one or two, uh, one or two different mechanisms. Trying to prevent this process, this damage process occurring, we've got all sorts of antioxidant enzymes and, we, and antioxidant compounds that we eat, lots of the vitamins and, and vegetables that we eat that try to protect us. We've got some other processes like some direct repair processes and, some, and growth arrest processes and damage removal and replacement or repair processes that all minimize that accumulation of damage that would otherwise occur. So I'm going to focus today on actually removal 
of damaged proteins, which we call proteolysis or protein degradation. In addition to all of these things, we've got something else which we call adaptive responses. This is uh, another name for this is hormesis. It's the idea that if you take a cell or take cells or take an organism and expose it to a very high stress of any kind, a chemical stress, oxidative stress, you can kill that organism. If, however, you first expose th that organism to a very low level of the same stress and allow some time for adaptation, you'll get genes that are being turned on that are protective, and if you then expose that organism to the much higher challenge level of stress, instead of dying or instead of being in real trouble, it'll survive and thrive. So this is hormesis or adaptive responses. It turns out that many of these processes or many of the enzymes and genes involved in these processes are turned on during adapt adaptive responses. And so we've been looking, we've done a lot of work over the last uh, 20 odd years on adaptation and adaptive responses, and we've become very interested in the idea that some of these adaptive responses to stress may actually decline with age. And if they're declining with age and you can't adapt to changing levels of stress, then perhaps that's why in that last third of life you start to accumulate da damage uh, products instead of being able to get rid of them as you would otherwise do. So here's a very simple adaptational experiment. And this happens to be yeast. You saw talk talking about Walter's work on yeast. The reason I'm showing you yeast apart from the fact that we did it, um, is we've done it in, in all sorts of cells, human cells, many other. Yeast show up better in a presentation like this. So you have a yeast growing on plates, and there are lots of colonies of yeast. If you expose them to a, a challenge level of hydrogen peroxide and oxidative stress, most of them die off. If you give them instead a very low level of stress, nothing happens to them. In fact, they grow a little better if you carefully examine these two. If you then take these cells that have been exposed to a low level of stress and wait a period of time, allow them to adapt, and then give them the challenge dose that you gave these fellows, they do fine. They survive. Instead of dying off, they do fine. Human cells don't do quite as well as that in adaptation, but they do very well. So this is an adaptive response. And we, we and other groups have been able to show that some 30 to 40 genes are upregulated. That means that these 30 to 40 genes are making more of their protein products, many of which are enzymes involved in protection during this adapt adaptation. Interestingly, and not well studied, about another 30 to 40 genes are down-regulated, and, and people have not looked at those so carefully. I want to focus today on, on two proteolytic enzymes. These are enzymes that get rid of oxidized proteins from cells, so they damage removal uh, products, damage removal proteins produced by, by various genes. The proteasome, which is in the cytoplasm and nucleus, and the LOM protease, which is in mitochondria. And what we think is going on is these, these are normal components now we've just, we've just found in the last few years. These are normal components of this adaptive response that we're now seeing seem to decline in age. So the proteasome is an incredibly large proteolytic enzyme, a huge protein that's actually each of these little balls is a separate protein. They all come together in these four rings, one, two, three, and four. Uh, it has multiple genes that make this whole thing, 28 different genes that make the whole thing. Uh, lots of... Of, of activators, inhibitors, and all sorts of things. Fascinating to study. Here's some other pictures of it. This is the core proteasome. Uh, proteins that are damaged actually get dragged into the inside of the cylinder and get degraded, and then, and then the little bits of the, the, the broken down protein are spat out at the bottom, and they can be reused or, or used for other pr purposes. Um, there are lots of activators. There are different lids that can be put on top that change the activity. There's a different form of the proteasome called an immunoproteasome won't bother with all of the details of all of that, but just to let you know that there are multiple forms, multiple activators. It's a, it's a complicated system. One of the things we showed years ago is that actually during stress, uh, there's, uh, you can actually turn on nuclear proteasome to, de to better degrade oxidized proteins with an enzyme that gets turned on that's called polyADP ribose polymerase. This is actually a DNA repair enzyme. So what's happening here is that this is a, a, this is a, a point at which DNA repair and protein degradation actually meet in, in, in response to an oxidant stress. Um, and this is a direct activation. This doesn't involve changing a gene expression. But in addition to that, uh, work recently from our lab is showing that these are hours after, uh, after, after pretreatment, after inducing an adaptive response. And this is the increases in proteolytic capacity of the proteasome during this, during this uh, adaptive response. So you can see it's very adaptive. We're getting dramatic increases in activity in the hours following stress. And here we're looking at, I showed you that picture with multiple different activators and different components of the proteasome. Here we're looking at many of the core subunits. Here, three, uh, three, two, two activators of the proteasome. And here are three subunits of, of what's called the immunoproteasome. So all of these things over a 24-hour period are being dramatically induced 
during this adaptive response. They're part of what protects the cell from damage, and if we don't allow them to be turned on, then we don't get the full adaptive response, and I haven't shown you that because I only have limited time. In aging, what we're seeing is a decreased cellular, uh, decreased cellular activity of proteasome. Uh, we're seeing about the same cellular content of proteasome, but lots of it's actually inhibited by aggregates of proteins. Uh, this actually, somehow this arrow reversed itself. Some things like that happen during presentations. This is a, should be a down arrow. So we get decreased transcription and translation of proteasome with aging, definitely decreased. And decreased degradation of oxidized proteins. We see an accumulation of oxidized proteins, and we're getting evidence now of decreased adaptability to oxidative stress uh, with aging. I want to switch right away to the, to the uh, long protease in mitochondria. We started work on this actually in 84, um, and have shown over the years that, that the long protease selectively degrades oxidized proteins inside mitochondria, and mitochondria are these little organelles within the cell that actually make all the cellular energy, so they're the powerhouses of the cell, as Albert Leninger used to call them. Uh, the the, uh, the long protease is actually like one ring of the proteasome that I showed you before. But it, actually, this ring is made up of seven different proteins, um, and it degrades oxidized proteins. It's strongly induced in, in mitochondria of young animals following various stresses, heat stress, starvation, oxidative stress. Uh, you heard Tuck talk about Volta's work on starvation, so it's part of that starvation response as well. And here's just some of those data. So here, looking at one, four, seven, or 25 hours after, in, after induction of stress, you can start to see LOM being increased. If you use a slightly higher pretreatment dose, you get a slightly better induction. If you use too much, it starts being less effective. If you use a lot more, it'll be toxic. So we get lots more LOM made. And that does it help protect? It certainly does. In this experiment, these cells were not, these are cells that have not been challenged. These cells were challenged with a very high level of oxidative stress, and you can see you're losing cell count, so that when losing cells, is, these cells are dying off. If, however, we first pretreat them with one of those levels of, of, of oxidant stress, very low levels that I showed you in this slide, so let's take this level that gave you a very big response of lawn, lots of lawn being made, then you save the cells, and many of them survive. In this, in this case, we use a little trick. We use the thing called siRNA that stops the gene being translated into its protein product, so you can't make the protein, and you block the protection. And you can see it both in terms of cell counts and mitochondrial function. So uh, <laughs> this is what happens in normal cells. We're now getting evidence that in aging, this ability to induce lawn is actually decreasing, and the, ability, and the level of, of lawn in tissues is declining. So here's the level of lawn protease, here's lawn activity, and these are old, uh, old mice. Uh, this is a young mouse lawn level. This is an old mouse lawn level. These two come from mice that, that, that are called heterozygotes. They have... And they have half the amount of, a, of an antioxidant enzyme called superoxide dismutase. So these animals are going throughout life, are being subjected to higher levels of oxidant stress. And interestingly, they have respectively lower levels in, both in young and old age than do the normal animals. And the same is true of their enzymatic activity. So lawn is declining. We see this in human beings as well, uh, a distinct lack of lawn in, in older tissues. Now we're finding that actually lawn uh, is, is not as inducible in, in older cells and especially in senescent cells. So here are senescent cells. These are cells approaching the end of life and very low levels of lawn. In this experiment, we're looking at not just lawn. We've got two levels of lawn, measures of lawn here. But, but here we're looking at what are called protein carbonyls, and that's shown from these gels. This is evidence of protein damage. So we get more protein damage accumulating in the senescent cells, the oldest cells. And here, if we try the adaptational experiment, so here's the one I showed you before. Here are young cells. We give them a, a, an adaptive dose of, high, of, of oxidant, and they adapt, and they produce lots of lawn, okay, in the young cells. Here, we're looking at the level of carbonyls, those protein oxidation products, almost nothing, as shown in the gels. If we jump to the middle age cells, so to speak, lots of protein carbonyls, protein damage accumulating, that's shown here, but we're still getting a uh, somewhat of an adaptation of lawn a little bit. If you look at the senescent cells, lawn is not able to adapt at all, and you've got lots and lots of carbonyls. So what we're thinking is happening here is that we're, for some reason, the signaling pathways that are involved in inducing lawn are being lost. Lawn is no longer inducible. The levels are lower to start with. It's no longer an inducible protein. Your ability to adapt to these systems is gone. So in general, 
in aging. We think there's a, a general decreased cellular adaptability, and I just used those two examples of proteasome and LOM, but we could, we've got lots of other examples of protective enzymes that now fit in this category. Decreased proteasome subunit regulator induction, decreased mitochondrial LON, decreased ADAPT gene in general. These other 40 odd genes we think are also going down. I actually don't think I need the whole minute, but we. <laughs> um, decreased shock and stress gene induction. And we think, that, and then we've looked at these in senescent models, proliferative models, post mitotic models, hyperoxic models, some animal studies, and limited, very limited human studies. Although, I'll, if anybody's interested in human studies, I can tell you more at question time. And I'd like to acknowledge Andrew Pickering, Andrew Standup, who's done some of the proteasome work that I showed you, uh, Rashmo Shringapur and Cheryl Teo, previous students, and for the LOM proteases, did Jenny make it today? Jenny, Jenny, Dr. Jenny Nago, who did the, the LOM, Jenny, stand up, who did the, the LOM protease work, and Daniela Bota, who was here before, and thank our funding agencies. Thank you very much. <laughs> Questions? So, Kelvin? Yes, uh, if the questions, I'll be happy to. So, Here's one of our younger scientists, Christian Pike. Who's, not, uh, not so young anymore. Not so young anymore. <laughs> it's all relative. Well, well, so one of the things you're seeing with aging is the loss of ability to induce lawn, and that's been associated with oxidative damage. Are there any other strategies that you guys are working on uh, on how to overcome the age-related decrease in lawn? In other words, is there another way to increase those levels? He's such a nice fellow, and the question wasn't even a plant. How nice is that? <laughs> um, so I, I mentioned also I'd be happy to talk about human studies. We're doing a lot of studies now uh, in collaboration with groups, uh, a group in France, a group in Italy, a group in England. Um, and they're all, of course, stuck in the, uh, in the volcano, in the volcanic ash at the moment. But those studies are still going on on the ground. And what we're looking at is, the, is the, what happens in exercise. And we're looking at, 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 at rats, and we're also looking at human beings. And it turns out that when you exercise is, is one form of oxidative stress, especially certain forms of extreme exercise. And so if you put rats on a treadmill or human beings, make them run a marathon, you'll get a lot of oxidative stress in tissues, and you will induce lawn normally. We're finding that in older animals, older people, lawn is nowhere near so inducible. However, if you take, and these are preliminary studies and preliminary findings not, not yet published, um, if you put those people on an exercise regimen and train them over a long period of time, you start to, you, we're seeing evidence that we may be able to reverse some of the loss. So it looks like LOM may be slightly recoverable in people that exercise regularly. Not yet absolutely con uh, convinced of it, but it looks pretty good. Extreme levels of. Uh, is there any benefit to a um, different? You talked about some of the benefits to different levels of exercise. So, uh, is there any benefit to uh, extreme levels? You know, running a human running a marathon versus uh, kind of a normal exercise routine that uh, most of us might be able to sustain. Yeah, I don't. I don't think there's much evidence that that the extremes are beneficial. Um, of course, one person's extreme might be another person's. Moderate, um, but I but I think there's there's lots of very good evidence that that a, that a moderate amount is is very good for you. Um, moderate might mean a little more severe than some people think, but nevertheless, there's not much evidence that running marathons is is better for you than say running five miles a day, um, that I've seen anyway. But five miles a day is pretty pretty good. I used to run five miles. A day. Yeah, <laughs> used to do a lot of things too. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. In this brief hi, uh, interlude, I uh, just wanted to be sure I thanked many members of the staff who've uh, made, this, um, made this possible. Some of them you see running around here. Uh, at risk of leaving somebody out, um, Greg Masiak, Emily Nabors, Anna Nguyen, Dana Kumabi, and also Kurt Shalin, May Ying, Jim Alejandri, Trevor Nelson, Linda Broda, Jim Devera, and Whitney Fountas. So um, we are, we, sometimes you're not aware of what's happening, and that shows how well they've done their job. So we really want to warmly thank these people.
Yeah, you're good. <laughs> we got it.